Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's special coverage on Gaza recent and their strikes. So the Palestinian militants fired rockets toward Al Quds on Sunday, causing no casualties, but signaling new reach and resolve as an Israeli pressed airstrikes in the Gaza Strip and admitted Jewish visitors to contested temple mosque compound. Let's follow the latest report and then we get back. This is all 24 news special and continuous coverage of the developments of the Zionist occupation's aggression on Gaza. Palestinian militants fired rockets toward Al Quds on Sunday, causing no casualties, but signaling new reach and resolve as Israel pressed airstrikes in the Gaza Strip and admitted Jewish visitors to a contested mosque compound. The Islamic Jihad faction said it targeted Jerusalem in retaliation for Israel's killings overnight of Khalid Mansour, its commander in southern Gaza. The blood of the martyrs will not be wasted, it said. Today, the death toll in Gaza reached 32 martyrs, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, including six children, while the number of wounded reached more than 215. For this, I am joined live by Palestinian activists from Al-Quds, Adnan Bark, and from Gaza, Mohammed Amin Al-Hadidi, and also from Gaza, Tariq Abarzoum. And to analyze further the situation, I am joined by Steve Sasebi, president and founder at Palestine Children's Relief Fund from USA, and Far Kim Bang from Malaysia. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. The insights right after this. Okay, to start. So here's what's on tap today. Islamic Jihad Resistance Group has launched a series of rockets to the Zionist side as a retaliation act against the last occupation assault. Islamic Jihad Group has fired over 160 rockets that were sometimes intercepted by the Zionist Iron Dome. However, many other rockets reached Tel Aviv. Let's follow this. 
In retaliation to the Zionist assault in the Gaza Strip, Islamic Jihad resistance group from the region has decided to launch a large number of long-range rockets towards Tel Aviv and the occupied Palestinian lands. This comes after the occupation forces had started the fight by killing one of the leaders of Islamic Jihad resistance group. The Zionist forces also killed several Palestinians in Gaza, including over five children. Moments after the launching of the rockets by the Palestinian group, sirens were heard going off. Zionist media did not announce any casualties on their side. However, reports revealed that several deaths followed the fall of rockets that penetrated the Iron Dome. Throughout the day, Gaza resistance groups regularly launched rounds of rockets into the southern region of the Zionist-occupied lands. The Palestinian resistance continued shelling the Israeli-occupied lands with the rockets fire in retaliation to the Israeli assault on Gaza. This morning, the resistance shelled Al-Quds and Tel Aviv in addition to settlement sites. Palestinian Islamic Jihad troops fired at least 160 rockets across the border, sending people running to bomb shelters as far as the city of Madin. A number of the missiles was intercepted. However, the next hours will surely reveal the casualties in the Zionist side, as the resistance group has explained that some tactics of their troops could break through the Zionist territory and would surely succeed to penetrate the Iron Dome. So let's kick it off with you, uh, Mr. Mohammed Amin Al Hadidi from Palestine. Could you please uh, tell us about the latest field developments uh, of the Zionist occupation's aggression on Gaza? What's the victim sentiments like? Okay, thank you for uh, hosting me. In the middle of the day of Friday, suddenly the Israeli air war plane directly targeted residential uh, apartment of citizens targeted, as well as military observatories. Uh, belonging to Saraya al-Quds bridges, uh, the Islamic uh, Jihad bridges. These attacks killed 10 civilians, including one of the leaders of Saraya al-Quds, Taysir al-Jabali, including, uh, um, uh, uh, including five years old girl and 23 years old. Next day, in Saturday, uh, Al-Quds uh, bridges, uh, uh, actually in Al-Quds bridges, uh, Saraya al-Quds bridges that uh, uh, the rest of the and the rest of the Palestinian resistance faction declared their right to respond and they bombed the surrounding cities uh, cities in uh, Gaza Strip with more than 100 missiles in the first day. On Saturday, the Israeli occupation continued to target uh, civilians uh, and commit uh, missiles, so they bombed the residential uh, residential home without warning. Among mm. was the, uh, uh, what was uh, bombed by the occupation's planes was uh, the commander of uh, Saraya al-Quds bridges in Rafah, Khalid Mansour. About five buildings were completely destroyed on this occupation, which uh, led to the death of seven civil, uh, citizens, including mm. young man who married one week ago and his mother. Mm -hmm. The Palestinian Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is the general view of the citizens in the area? Were there any protests so far being held or is there anything being prepared? Again, please. I said like what is the general view and general sentiment of the citizens in Gaza and uh, were there any protests uh, being held uh, in the Gaza Strip or is there anything being prepared soon? Actually, we don't know about, but uh, just uh, the Palestinian Ministry of Health announced that there are 33 shelled, including six uh, children and four women, 265 injured, uh, the first kind. The Palestinian bridges uh, say, uh, the, uh, the spokesman of Al Jihad Islami said that they are not uh, to stop, uh, not the things to stop this war because the Israeli side who was began this and uh, not, uh, the, they don't have the right to stop it. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps I redirect the question to Mr. Tariq Abu Azum, who just joined us. Uh, uh, Mr. Tariq Abu Azum, uh, thank you and uh, for agreeing to be with us again on this special coverage. Can you tell us about the general views of the citizens and the general sentiment in the area? Were there any uh, protests or is there anything being prepared uh, for the time being or perhaps uh, near in the future? Uh, well, uh, thank you for hosting me today. Actually, uh, most of the Palestinian citizens expressed their rejection and their uh, great refusal 
for the Israeli crimes on the uh, occupied Palestinians here in the Gaza Strip. And actually, dozens of protesters were uh, erupted and were organized in the West Bank, uh, expressing the great uh, rejection of the Palestinian uh, severity caused by the colonial Israeli state. And probably during the last couple of days, uh, actually, more, uh, most of the Palestinians live such a very uh, dramatic losses for their beloved ones. Actually, most of the Palestinian residential buildings were destroyed in the Gaza Strip, especially in Rafah uh, district, where more than uh, five buildings were completely leveled to the ground by the Israeli airstrikes in the middle night. Uh, which led to the uh, assassination of top Palestinian commanders in the Palestinian resistance. Probably during the last couple of days, more than 20 tons of rockets uh, fall over the Palestinian uh, head sea and the Gaza Strip. Actually, in Jabalia refugee camp yesterday, more than 30 Palestinians were injured due to the Israeli uh, bombardment for a residential area which, without any kind of a previous warning. Besides, uh, there is a kind of more than 30 uh, Palestinians were injured in different areas around the Gaza Strip due to the Israeli uh, strikes for residential towers, for uh, farmlands and for even uh, innocent civilians. And actually, uh, the Palestinian cannot really accept the statute code that has been imposed by the Israeli occupation on Palestine. Actually, the Israeli occupation has started this escalation and this great aggression on the Palestinian without any without any let's just say proof or let's say uh, justification about uh, this attack. They claim that they are trying to eliminate the Palestinian resistance, who just cause a great threat for the uh, the so-called Israeli uh, community. But mainly, in fact, they are a new chapter has been added to the Israeli history of crimes against Palestinians here in the Gaza Strip. And probably if you'd like to have more details about that, you just can look to the Palestinian children who were passed away and were killed due to the Israeli uh, bombardment uh, in the Gaza Strip here. And uh, what is really surprising in the last couple of hours that Israel is trying to say that they have achieved their goals from this operation and they would like to make a ceasefire with the Palestinians. We don't know like who uh, actually started the aggression and they are now calling for a ceasefire and they just ignore the Palestinian right to defend themselves. So actually, the situation in the Gaza Strip here is so complex and they are trying to uh, intensify and to exaggerate pressure on the Palestinian in order to stop struggling against the Israeli crimes and stop responding to the Israeli violations. And even in the morning today, uh, the uh, Israeli wing extremists have uh, remarkably uh, stormed Al-Aqsa Mosque, even without paying any attention to the international demands of the international community, like to stop their violation in the West Bank and even and in, in, in Jerusalem in particular. And at the same time, they are attacking civilians here in the Gaza Strip. They are even trying to make such a great pressure over Palestinians. And they even try to, to prefer a plan type regarding the uh, international demands to stop violations and to make a uh, ceasefire agreement with the Palestinians here in the Gaza Strip. Thank you so much, Mr. Tariq, for all these uh, insights. And uh, Mr. Steve Sasebe is joining us now. How do you assess the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip in light of the talk about running out of medicines and medical supplies here? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and uh, salam alaikum to all the esteemed guests. Uh, I think it's important to remember that this crisis, this humanitarian crisis in Gaza is not a reflection of the current bombing that is going on on the people of Gaza, that Gaza itself has been under siege for nearly 20 years now. And that siege uh, has a Im significant impact on the humanitarian situation in, in Gaza, meaning that hospitals already have a shortage of medical supplies, that the building of infrastructure and medical infrastructure, humanitarian infrastructure in Gaza has been thwarted and has been slowed and even prevented for many years. And that patients in Gaza who need medical treatment that's not available in Gaza, for example, uh, about half of them are denied uh, access to treatment outside. So the humanitarian crisis is not new in the last couple of days. It's been going on for years and years, and it has a widespread impact throughout the Gaza Strip. It prevents people from having adequate um, resources, from having access to medical care, having access to adequate uh, support, um, food, medicine, medical care, even uh, clean water, clean air, uh, g adequate education, so on and so forth. It's in, in every aspect of human life that you can imagine that normal people live in, in the rest of the world, in Gaza, the people there are denied that same mm -hmm. basic fundamental rights 
uh, and humanitarian aid. So it's clear that these kind of um, the bombing that we're seeing in the last couple of days, for example, is having even a deeper impact because what limited materials and supplies that do exist in the hospitals, for example, are now being used to treat injured civilians and injured people that are coming in for care, people who are being injured by shrapnel, by bombing, by buildings being destroyed and falling, so on and so forth. In addition to that, you have the normal needs of people every day in Gaza who still need medical care and medical attention and humanitarian aid. We all know that Gaza being under siege for the last nearly 20 years has resulted in a huge uh, economic um, depression. Uh, you know, nearly half the population don't work, don't have jobs, don't have income to feed their families, and therefore are dependent on humanitarian organizations to come in and provide them the aid that they otherwise be, would be able to provide themselves. Gaza people are very hardworking and they're very educated. Um, they want to be able to take care of their families, but they don't have that ability because of the closure and the siege that's been imposed upon them. Mm -hmm. So this humanitarian crisis, it's just deepened in the last couple of days because of the huge number of injured and casualties that are coming into the hospitals. But it's an ongoing crisis. And the world looks away. The world does nothing. Um, we're all very well aware of what the current situation is in Gaza. It's very well documented by the United Nations and by other humanitarian organizations and governments. And yet the world decides to do nothing about it. I think that's the great tragedy of what's going on in Gaza. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I mean, different development. Uh, the Zionist attacks have killed a second top militant from the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group. As the death toll continues to rise from airstrikes in Gaza, six children and several fighters, including leaders Khaled Mansour and Taysir Jabari, are among the 32 Palestinians reported to have died. Injuries number of the Zionist attack has exceeded the 250 people, while the number will probably rise. Let me get back to you, Mr. Uh, Steve Sasabe. Why does the occupation always target the symbols of the resistance successfully? Like the prominent leader in the Islamic Jihad uh, movement, Taysir al Jabari and Khalid Mansour. <laughs> well, I, I run a humanitarian organization on the ground in Palestine. I've been doing it for 30 years. I first went to Palestine as a journalist during the first Intifada in 1988. Uh, first, I was a college student, then I went to work as a journalist. So I've been going and living in Palestine for more than 30 years, and I've seen firsthand all aspects of the occupation and the Palestinian resistance, not just resistance in the sense of firing rockets, but in the human resistance of staying steadfast and Samud on their land. Um, I'm not here to comment what the uh, purpose or the motivations of the Israeli attacks on Palestinian symbols uh, are. You would have to ask an Israeli official about that. But I can tell you that there has been an ongoing campaign for many, many years, and this is, goes back even to the British occupation during the mandate period, the colonization of Palestine mm -hmm. from 1917 to 1948, when they also were killing Palestinian leaders in thinking that this would destroy the Palestinian resistance, as if this resistance is based on personalities of the Palestinian leadership and not on the causes of the Palestinian people living under uh, oppressive systems of under occupation, under colonization. And that's the real root cause here. Killing leaders, whoever they are, whatever their background are, whether they're militants, whether they're political leaders, however you want to define them and, and refer to them, is not going to change the reality of the Palestinians struggling for freedom in trying to end this occupation. And I think that's the mm -hmm. mis misconception or the miscalculation on the part of not just the Israeli government, but all governments who think that these grassroots uh, uh, resistance movements like the Palestinians have can somehow be beheaded and will stop. It will not stop. Mm -hmm. And until you address the root cause of occupation, of displacement, mm -hmm. of the lack of freedom and equality for the Palestinian people, there will continue to be uh, conflict in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. Very nice indeed. Nice and indeed. Uh, Mr. Tariq Abu Azum, in a similar context, and in this aggression, the occupation attempts to separate the West Bank and Gaza between Jihad and Hamas, according to uh, the statement of the officials of the occupation authorities. What does this mean in your opinion, and what policy does, does it support? Well, actually, the Israeli occupation tried to drive a wedge between the Palestinian faction, uh, even especially between the Palestinian faction members. They are trying to make such a great gap and to exacerbate the current situation that they were the very reason to create uh, and to make it much better, much, let's say, uh, dangerous right now. 
actually uh, the Palestinian resistance here are working together in order to respond to the Israeli crimes against the Palestinian uh, civilians in the Gaza Strip properly. And they'd like to split the Palestinian uh, and to make like a, a very clear divisions in order to uh, terrify Palestinians and in order to uh, make such a great gap between the, under, the level of understanding between the Palestinian faction, which can really serve the Israeli interests in their uh, schemes or sinister schemes. And this mm -hmm. was uh, totally clear during the last Israeli aggression on the Gaza Strip. Actually, the Israeli occupation has clearly suffered from the Palestinian unity regarding the Palestinian resistance faction, mm -hmm. and they actually worked as one party during mm -hmm. the last Israeli aggression on the Gaza Strip, which was erupted in 2021 due to the Israeli non-stopping violations in al aqsa mm -hmm. Mosque and beside the in cleansing process that had been made against the uh, Palestinian families in mm -hmm. the Sh Jarrah neighborhood. So they clearly understand like, the lesson that they have really noticed during the last Israeli aggression on the Gaza Strip that in order to defeat the Gazans, we must make a kind of split between them. And we'd mm -hmm. like to drive away and Mr. the Tariq Abu Azum, say the situation will persist. Yep. What are the challenges challenges that are awaiting the Islamic Jihad movement after the occupation's assassination of its prominent leaders. What are the challenges that await specifically the Al-Quds Brigades Room and also the Joint Operations Room? Well, actually, the uh, Joint Operation Room and all the Palestinian uh, resistance faction, they have a kind of high level of coordination between each other and they have a kind of such a great unity in the battlefield and they just understand the situation well and they have a kind of, of a very cooperative approach to deal with the Israeli crimes against Palestinians here. Actually, the loss of different leaders regarding the the, uh, the Islamic Jihad movement is, it will not be the end of the world and the Palestinians, uh, whatever, or how much the uh, the loss will be they will continue in the road of liberation of liberating the land until they manage to uh, kick off uh, to, i'm sorry to kick out the israeli occupation from the land actually uh, the um, Israeli occupation focuses on uh, destroying the Palestinian will and Palestinian desire to fight and to keep fighting for their mm. rights and their freedoms. And they'd like to create a kind of statute code that Palestinians must accept everything that they uh, could be afforded from the international mediators or even from the regional mediators. Very well so indeed. actually, the, uh, the, the, the Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip and even all the Palestinian resistance faction are working as one body and they are trying to uh, to give a response to the uh, to the Israeli non stop crimes against Palestinians here in the Gaza Strip mm -hmm. and even in the West Bank and occupied Jerusalem. Quite understood. Uh, thank you so much. And the bodies of eight martyrs were reportedly found under the debris of the house that was destroyed by the Zionist warplanes on the heads of its occupants last night in the Ashouth neighborhood of Rafa camp in the southern Gaza Strip. The bodies of the martyrs were pulled out from rubble by Palestinian citizens, rescue teams, ambulance crews and civil defense. Back to you, Mr. Steve uh, Sasebi. Are we going to expect any help from international communities coming anytime soon? Of course, there's always there's a widespread interest, desire and will among um, the international community. Um, whether they're NGOs, whether they're governments who are sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinian people, who want to show that they're sympathetic. I guess that's a more accurate way to yes, put it. Um, uh, of course, there's always a response and there's always a willingness to show that we care and stand with our brothers and sisters who are suffering in Gaza. Um, however, uh, there's always a challenge uh, to get aid to the people in need there, um, a challenge of getting that aid directly to the people who need it. Uh, that's the biggest challenge and that's the biggest issue now. And there's also this continued kind of false promises by the international community to provide aid. Uh, we've seen that for years after the bombings in 2009, 2008 and 2009, the bombings in 2012 and 2000, um, and the most recent ones, there's always these large uh, declarations for public consumption that there's going to be a huge influx of foreign aid to help rebuild Gaza and provide better standard of living and better quality of life for the people there. But when you go to Gaza, you often see that that is not a truly uh, that that aid doesn't come that a lot of times that is just propaganda or false promises for public consumption in those countries. But in the end, once the uh, news changes back to other issues around the world, 
people forget or don't pay as much attention and uh, that aid never materializes and the people in Gaza continue to suffer. And that's what I think will happen again. However, organizations like ours who are on the ground in Gaza and continue to provide direct humanitarian support, we've built a cancer department mm -hmm. for children there, we've provided thousands of children medical care, surgery, treatment, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Our obligation and our duty to the people uh, on Gaza, not the politicians, but the people, uh, remain steadfast and we will continue to do all we can yeah. to help those in need. Very nice indeed. And Mr. Mohammed Amin Al Hadadi, what kind of help can other countries provide to Gaza, according to you? What kind of assistance or different kinds of assistance that uh, Gazans need? Uh -huh. Okay, a short while ago, the Palestinian Ministry of Health announced 48 hours separating us from a cessation of health uh, services after the power plants stopped and limited the quantities of fuel were depleted in hospital generators. It's announced of the ministry stores contain 40% of the total medicine it needs and that Israeli occupation refuses to bring in 14 medicine device needed to the Gaza Strip hospital. Mm -hmm. Many of homes and buildings are completely destroyed. All of this make uh, the Gaza Strip in a hard situation and in a dangerous situation, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mohammed Amin Al Hadidi. You were live with us uh, from Gaza Strip. Uh, I redirect the, the question now to uh, Mr. Tariq Abarzoum. If you can tell us, uh, apparently it's not the assistance uh, that is needed in Gaza because we see a lot of humanitarian aid being sent there, but then it's the Israeli that are blocking that. What is your comment? Um, I, again, please, I cannot hear you well. I, I was talking about uh, the uh, blockade of uh, the Israeli over the international uh, aid that is uh, reaching the Gaza Strip. Or every single time there is uh, such dire situation, we see that international communities rush to send uh, 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 different kinds of, uh, let's say, assistance and help. But then it's the Israeli that are blocking that. Uh, what is your comment and reading on that? Well, it's not a new policy, probably. It's, it has been used and applied by the Israeli occupations on all times of conflict, by the way. So in every conflict and in every aggression carried out by the Israeli occupation on the Palestinian territories, whether going to be in the uh, occupied Jerusalem, West Bank, or even here in the Gaza Strip, they are trying to deprive Palestinians from simple basic rights that has been afforded and granted by all of the international norms and international laws. Uh, and actually, they are trying to make a kind of a systematic process which can really force Palestinians to feel that were and even defending their lands will bring them such a great harm regarding their economic and uh, social conditions. And actually, uh, all the international community, uh, the majority of the international community organizations that are trying to rush to send uh, medical aids and even to, to, to support Gazans with different kinds of uh, aids, uh, including humanitarian aids. But actually, the, uh, the barbarian nature of the Israeli occupation and its colonialism and the nature of uh, the uh, the occupier prevents uh, Palestinians from their basic needs and even they would like Palestinians to die uh, of hunger to try to medically suffer and even uh, the people who are ta being targeted by the Israeli war plans cannot really receive the medical treatment uh, due to the great shortage of medical supplies in the Palestinian mm -hmm. hospitals in part, uh, generally and in the Shifa hospital in particular. So all the time they are trying to deprive Palestinians from the basic, uh, from their right or the basic needs in order to not stand firmly against the Israeli violations and this will exert much pressure the Palestinian local condition here in the Gaza Strip, mm -hmm. which made them get immediately anxious of the great uh, or, or the great deterioration that has been witnessing here in the Gaza Strip. But actually, the Palestinian believe that sooner or later, Palestine, Palestine is going to be liberated, and even the international community, uh, regarding the great and the notable aid provided to the Palestinians, they understand clearly that the Israeli occupation will not leave them alone and will not even let the Palestinian to uh, have a normal life like other ordinary people around the globe and they will try to focus on exacerbating the current Palestinian internal situation. Thank you so much for all these insights and in a different development uh, uh, at a time when Palestinian civilians are being bombed by the Zionist artillery occupation settlers moved to Al-Aqsa Mosque 
in a move, a provocative move for Palestinians. Many of the natives in Al-Quds were arrested by the Zionist forces as they showed the refusal of such acts amid the rising tension between the Islamic Jihad resistance group and Israeli occupiers. Mr. Steve Sasebe, in addition to the aggression against Gaza that the Israeli occupation opened, today the way for settlers to insult the blast Al-Aqsa Mosque. What is the motive behind such move, in your opinion? Well, I think it has a couple of motivations, and I'm speaking just as my former journalist self. I did a store, I did a very deep research on Al-Aqsa Mosque or Haram al-Sharif, or the Temple Mount is the... Israelis call it and we know historically that this goes back to a very contested area where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven mm -hmm. um, And that also the Jewish people had a temple there, which was destroyed by the Romans um, For many uh, religious Jews, they believe that the only way that the Messiah will come to earth is That if they rebuild the temple, this is their belief and there's a large number of Israelis who strongly believe that they therefore and unfortunately for them that this uh, area of the Temple Mount is now occupied by Islam's third holiest site, Al-Aqsa Mosque. So they cannot rebuild the temple and have the Messiah come um, in their belief uh, without rebuilding, without removing first Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the Israelis now, as we all know, occupy East Jerusalem, captured in June of 1967, and therefore are able through the use of force and might and also legal coverage under their court system um, to try to change the status of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Al-Haram Al-Sharif uh, compound, um, which would then pave way for them, hopefully for the religious Jewish population, um, a chance to rebuild the Temple Mount and begin their uh, what their religious beliefs are for bringing the Messiah to the earth. Mm -hmm. That sounds a bit complicated, but uh, at the end, it's also a political struggle because the mm -hmm. Palestinians, of course, uh, and the, much of the world recognizes East Jerusalem as occupied. And, uh, and in, in addition to that, that this is contested and needs to be negotiated. And that without a real negotiation, that uh, East Jerusalem remains uh, on the table for future uh, negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And therefore, um, any act that tries to change the status of these compounds or these religious sites on the ground there is a violation of international law. Um, the Israelis, of course, don't see it like that, and therefore we have a huge level of tension and conflict uh, surrounding these holy sites, not only Al-Aqsa, but we saw it recently in uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and other areas in East Jerusalem and uh, Al-Quds. So we all know at the end of the day that this area has to be negotiated. There's no question that we cannot continue to have this status quo, which is a huge source of conflict. Uh, not only in Palestine and in Israel, but all over the world for people of all religions. Mm -hmm. And putting off this uh, effort to find a solution that brings some sense of uh, uh, resolution to this conflict and uh, hopefully paves a new way towards peace and reconciliation and equality and freedom for all people living in the Holy Land. Uh, the longer we put that off, the more that we're going to see these kinds of significant conflicts, which has a tremendous impact on the lives of people, particularly those in Gaza, but all over the Holy Land are being impacted, even on the Israeli side. Uh, not only uh, those who are being impacted by the conflict directly, uh, whether it's through being injured or killed, and we don't like to see that on any side, um, but also the fact that the Israelis now are becoming more and more extreme in their political views and ideology because there is no leader who's willing to pave the way forth, mm -hmm. forth towards reconciliation with the Palestinians and bringing a just peace for all people there. And until we have a leader who's going to step up and have the courage to resolve these issues and end the occupation and bring equality and freedom for everybody living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, we're going to continue to have these this level of conflict, killing, mm -hmm. destruction, and misery, and Quite that's really the root cause. Thank you so much. You and so much. Uh, Mr. Tariq Abu Azoum, a tense and inflamed situation in Al-Quds after settlers were allowed to enter the courtyards of the Blast Al-Aqsa Mosque, as well as hardline members of the Knesset, including Itmir Ben Gvir. What's your comment? Well, actually, the Israeli you non-stopping know, uh, provocation and storming to Al-Aqsa Mosque represents such a great provoca provocation uh, for uh, more than one uh, billion uh, Muslims around the globe, actually, because Al-Aqsa Mosque is considered to be like the third important uh, holiest shrine 
for more than 1.7 billion Muslims around the world. And actually, uh, all the uh, Islamic countries have called the, um, the uh, Israeli occupation to, uh, to stop their violations and their provocative uh, procedures in Al-Aqsa Mosque, but actually they did not comply with their demands. And even the uh, Israeli occupation uh, and the Israeli colonial, the starting to make a kind of sinister schemes in order to make a division and split in Al-Aqsa Mosque in order to have a, such a complete control over Al-Aqsa Mosque and its compound properly. And they are trying to, to make or to set some certain times for Muslims mm -hmm. to have their work shopping, while the other time or the end of the day will be for the Israeli settlers to uh, to perform their Talmudic performance and Talmudic prayers. Mr. Tariq Actually, Azum, street... what kind of repercussions can occur after allowing settlers to enter the court of the Blast Al-Aqsa Mosque, especially at this particular time that coincides with the aggression on Gaza. Actually, this uh, probably uh, got to fuel uh, the great tension, which is... Mm -hmm. Apparently, apparently, we lost uh, the connection uh, with Mr. Tariq Abarzum. Perhaps I can redirect the question to Mr. Uh, Sansabi. Uh, can you answer this question uh, in, in this particular time that coincides with the uh, shelling over Gaza? What kind of repercussions are we expecting from allowing settlers to enter the Aqsa Mosque? Historically, we've seen... Uh the, well, there's different kinds of repercussions, whether we're talking about a response from the international community, which I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for that. But we do see the provocation towards the more militant elements of the Palestinian resistance, whether it's Hamas or the Islamic Jihad, are pushed themselves into a situation where they feel they have to respond through the use of rockets and uh, military action, uh, which only further continues the cycle of bombings and killings and destruction, particularly in the Gaza Strip. It also puts the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank in a very difficult situation because they are under a lot of scrutiny by their own people to show that they are also uh, resisting occupation or standing for the Palestinian rights and Palestinian movement, national liberation movement or freedom movement. And by standing aside and letting Islam's third holiest site to be violated, uh, they will uh, put themselves in a situation where they have to do something to respond. Otherwise, they will lose credibility and lose face further. And that's a very difficult political situation for the leadership in the West Bank to have to deal with. And they've not mm -hmm. shown themselves able to stand up in the past and really deal with this in a very effective way. Very nice. And very nice. Politically, there's no military option for anyone to resolve these issues. Uh, everything has to be resolved politically. Mm -hmm, very nice indeed. And the, the Zionist attacks on the Palestinians have caused damage and destruction in the besieged city of Gaza. Several people were brutally killed and dozens of houses were destroyed, leaving residents homeless in their own land. Let's follow this report by Nabil Khazini and then we continue the discussion. The brutality continues and the Zionist forces show again that their aggression on civilians in Palestine is not going to stop. This belligerence, or rather inhuman acts targeting unarmed civilians, have killed Palestinians, among them innocent children. We were sitting in the street and suddenly we saw an explosion. We came running to the place and found body parts lying on the ground. And there were no ambulances. There were torn children. We carried the children in the cars because there were no ambulances. And this is what happened. In Gaza, scenes of grief and destruction of properties are the outcome of the Zionist attacks. Only furniture and personal belongings from damaged houses are what is left in a long time besieged city where residents speak only of panic among civilians when airstrikes broke out. Without any warning, they targeted the area, which is the Ashout area near the Kuwaiti hospital. Of course, it's a camp crowded with children, women and elderly. The continued blockade of the occupier on Gaza has resulted in the Palestinian Energy Authority to announce the suspension of the only power plant in the area. The occupation authorities had announced suddenly on Friday afternoon that they would enter quantities of fuel for the station, but it did not. Another betrayal, a used to in Palestine, before the aggression on the Gaza Strip began. The power plant will stop working due to shortage of fuel needed for its operation. It has already been shut down, so the power company lost 60 megawatts that this plant was supplying. 
The Zionist entity continues its strategy of aggression at a time when the watching world is blind against these age-old tactics, bombardments and siege. But in Palestine, people have vowed to resist till the end. And now we are joined live by Dr. Farkim Bang, a political analyst and also specialist in Middle Eastern matters from Malaysia. Hello there, uh, Mr. or uh, Dr. Kim uh, Fang Ben. Uh, what is your general analysis of the recent brutal aggression by the Zionist states against innocent and unarmed civilians under the pretext that they are targeting resistance groups? But in reality, we all bear witness that residential areas were the ones that are targeted. Well, first of all, whenever anyone comment about Palestine, whether it is in West Bank or Gaza, uh, we are looking at a very sad and endearing tragedy. We have long wars in Asia, such as in southern Thailand or some in southern Mindanao, that have been flaring in various forms for more than 500 years. But this conflict in Palestine is an indictment of the international legal order because when the Palestinians are suffering, there are occasions such as this one when all the voices of dissent are not being heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Steve uh, Sasebi, he is saying that the voice of Palestinians is not being heard. What can you tell us about media bias regarding covering stories uh, over Palestine? I mean, it's a complicated issue. There's no question that the Palestinian voice is not being heard, that it's not accurately portrayed in the mainstream media, particularly in the United States, where, um, you know, there is a lot of effort to kind of keep the Palestinian voice down, whether it's at the universities with activists, whether it's in the mainstream media. This is definitely true. Uh, however, we do see in other places in the world, there is a greater opportunity for the Palestinian point of view or the Palestinian narrative to be heard and to be expressed. One of the main challenges we face is that we don't don't necessarily have always uh, the best voices on the Palestinian side expressing the Palestinian viewpoint, which is at the end of the day is a simple issue of freedom and justice for the Palestinian people. Uh, there, uh, the idea that it's characterized as some kind of effort to destroy Israel or to kill the Jewish people is simply not true. I've been living in Palestine for more than 30 years and I know firsthand there's no intention to do harm to the Jewish people. It's simply an, an effort to bring freedom and equality for the Palestinian people to not live under occupation, to not live in refugee camps, to not live as diaspora populations and borders surrounding Palestine. That's the issue here. However, that's not how it's portrayed in the media. There is this constant effort to demonize, dehumanize and uh, portray the Palestinians or the Muslim people or the Arab people in general as somehow subhuman or not sharing the same human values that the rest of the world has. And that's, I think, an effort to be able to continue to treat them in the most dehumanized manner as we see in Gaza in the last couple of days and we've seen many times and for forcing people to live under occupation is a result of continuing to portray them in the media as being subhuman are not somehow equal to the values that the rest of the world shares. And that's not mm -hmm. true. We all know that, but this is the manner and this is the result of this lack of equality in the media to have their voice and their issue heard equally. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Kim Fang, uh, uh, Kim Bank, can you tell us what can be done in order to avoid this bias? Well, first of all, there are 25 regional organizations around the world, aside from the United Nations. We always expect the United Nations to speak up, but from time to time, it's also obligatory for the regional organization, such as European Union, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, so on and so forth, to look into this issue in a more systematic manner of how the abuses have actually been organized and orchestrated over more than a, a century. Mm -hmm. And moving on now, Zionist Prime Minister Ayir Lapid and Defense Minister Benny Gantz said on Sunday that the military operation in Gaza Strip would continue as long as necessary. The statement emerges from declarations broadcast by the Zionist channel Ken as the operation launched on Friday is still ongoing.
Back to you, Dr. Far Kim Bang. The Israeli Defense Forces said that the attacks will not stop and there are more targets. What does this mean exactly? Well, there is a saying in international relations or political science that all politics are local. And the nature and the intensity of this attack and the persistent characteristics of this attack since 2005 um, mm -hmm. is an indication that it has become this issue has become entwined with the domestic politics of Israel. And an election is coming up on November 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And all stakes are involved. And the current interim prime minister, Naftali, simply mm -hmm. has to take a very hawkish and strong stance in order to showcase himself as the leader of Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Uh, Steve Sansabi, after Washington's statement that the occupation has the right to defend itself, how do you evaluate the American position regarding what is happening, especially since this coincides with U.S. President, I mean, just recently, uh, U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to the region? I mean, this is a longstanding American policy to support Israel during these type of um, conflicts. And uh, this is not going to change. It's a reflection of, I think, the domestic political uh, situation in the United States. Um, the Israel, our government is very much the American government is very much influenced by special interest groups, by lobby organizations. And we have a very strong pro-Israel lobby group called here APAC in the United States, which has a very strong influence on the American foreign policy in the American government and the Ameri those who are elected in the American um, system. And the Palestinians or the Arabs don't have uh, any form of influence or lobbying going on on the ground in, uh, or in the United States political system. And therefore, it's a very unbalanced reflection of foreign policy that isn't based on international law. It's not based on human rights law. It's not based on even what's the best interest of the Israeli people, because we all know that ending this conflict in a just manner is in the best interest in the, in the security of Israel and the Israeli people. Uh, the United States policy does not reflect that. Uh, and therefore, um, it's a reflection of domestic politic, political interests and a kind of, uh, let's just say, I don't want to say corrupted, but uh, uh, Detected, undemocratic perhaps, system perhaps. that's influenced by money and influenced by special interests and that's how the American government its foreign policy on the issue of Palestine and Israel is uh, is uh, constructed mm -hmm. and following the attacks of the Zionist forces against the Gaza Strip the world has reacted and condemned these brutal attacks the Algerian foreign ministry published a report where it has strongly condemned the brutal aggression by the Zionist forces and expressed its deep concern of any dangerous escalation. The Algerian Foreign Ministry said that Algeria calls upon the international community, especially the UN Security Council, to intervene urgently to stop these criminal attacks to impose respect for the rights of the Palestinian people. The UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process warned the dangerous escalation and said that the launching of rockets must cease immediately and he called also on all sides to avoid further escalation. The European Union called for restraint from all sides to avoid further escalation and casualties in the Gaza Strip, while the Palestinian Authority condemned the Zionist aggression on the Gaza Strip and demanded its immediate cessation. The United States called for the de-escalation in the Gaza Strip in a press statement. Also, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby urged all parties to avoid further escalation. The General Secretariat of the League of Arab States condemned in the stronger terms the fierce Zionist aggression that began on the Gaza Strip, which comes in the context of ongoing official war of the Israeli occupation against the Palestinian people. Qatar reiterated the state of Qatar's firm position on the justice of all the Palestinian cause, the legitimate rights of the brotherly Palestinian people, and the establishment of their independent state on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. In a statement, the Turkish Foreign Ministry urged restraint and common sense following the deadly attacks on the blockaded enclave.
Back to you, Dr. Farkinbank. Many countries are trying to play a mediation role here to de-escalate the tensions. What major role can be played by these countries here? And by whom exactly? Who can be the right mediator, according to you? If we go back to the roots of the Madrid peace process after the end of the first Gulf War, which led to the second track diplomacy conducted by the Norwegian government, which eventually led to the peace agreement between Palestine and Israel, resulting in Gaza and West Bank, uh, we can potentially consider Norway again, or some of the Scandinavian countries, uh, such as Denmark, Finland, uh, Sweden. These are countries that are not completely undermined by the so-called lobbying process that was mentioned by your American commentator earlier, which is APEC. So mm -hmm. these entities provide a realistic chance and my heart goes out to all the victims and uh, on, on either side because war is not something that we as a human species would like to witness or even uh, go through. Mm -hmm. Very nice indeed. And Mr. Tariq Abu Azum, at the regional level, how does the level of normalization that uh, some countries play with the occupation reflect and what is happening on Gaza? Well, actually, uh, unfortunately, uh, some of the Arabian uh, countries rush to normalize with the Israeli occupation, uh, thinking that this will bring tranquility and will help and serve the interest. But actually, it uh, will affect the Palestinian coast in a very, very incredible support from the Arabian people here uh, in the region and they are trying to uh, to put limitation for the Israeli crimes by losing Arabian countries who rush to normalize with the Israeli occupation. They are giving the occupation the, like a kind of legitimization and they're trying to, walk, to whitewatch uh, their, their, their images, uh, their dark images about their crimes committed against Palestinians. And even throughout normalization, they are trying to impose kind a kind of mm. well, it seems that we're having uh, some uh, connection problem with you, Mr. Tariq Azum. We're going to get back to you uh, a bit later. Mr. Steve uh, Sasabi, aggression is continuous on Gaza, but no clear voices are being heard to denounce the aggression of the occupation. In your opinion, what did the normalizing countries gain with the Zionist occupation? That's a good question, and perhaps you should ask a political analysis uh, an analyst such a question because all I am is just a, a simple person trying to serve the Palestinian people through humanitarian work and relief work. So I really don't I, I don't have an opinion as to what the gains are for the countries who uh, made uh, a peace agreement with Israel and uh, did not include the rights of the Palestinians. We saw that back during the uh, Camp David Accords when Egypt uh, signed the peace agreement, although they did have a stipulation for ending the occupation. In the West Bank and Gaza, it was never enforced and upheld. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I re honestly, I don't understand why um, any of uh, the Arab regimes made a peace agreement with Israel without including an end to the occupation in the best interest of Israel and everybody else. Um, but I don't think the Palestinian uh, issue any longer is a priority for some of the governments in this, that part of the world. Uh, but I can tell you, traveling all over the Middle East, that the will of the Middle Eastern people and the people all over the world, for the most part, stand with the Palestinians. They see this as an issue of justice and the government's mm -hmm. policies mm -hmm. may not reflect that. But the will of the people certainly is to stand with the Palestinians until there is equality and freedom and peace. Mm -hmm. And earlier we had a phone call with the Palestinian ambassador to Algeria, Mr. Faiz Mohammed Mahmoud Abu Aita. We asked him about the uh, renewed attacks on Gaza and how they are justified by the Zionist entity. And he has this to say. The aggression against Al-Quds, Nablus and Jenin has been mostly brutally repeated, in particular in the Gaza Strip. This demonstrates that the Zionist occupation continues to commit crime after crime in continuous series of crimes by the Zionist occupation army against the Palestinian people. 
وهذا يدلل بشكل قاطع على أن هذا الاحتلال لم يعد يأبى. This unmistakably demonstrates that this occupation no longer clearly affects and give a matter to the international community and to the United Nation law or the countries of the world that denounce such crimes and thus requires a clearer and stricter attitude from the international community of the United Nations and the international community at large, not only to condemn these crimes, but to curb and put an end to these occupations ongoing crimes. <laughs> Mr. Mahmoud or Mohammed Mahmoud Abu Aita also tackled the global double standards on the Palestinian issue, saying that everyone denounced the Russian military operation in Ukraine, but no one is talking about the Zionist entities' repeated crimes against an unknown people in Palestine. This question must be addressed to the international community, particularly to the United States of America and to the European countries which have taken contrary position on the Russian military operation in Ukraine at a time when the Palestinian people are subjected to terrible massacres, but no one dares directly to condemn the Zionist entity for these crimes. No one stead with the Palestinian people whom their lands are being taken by force daily. Who wants to condemn the aggression against sovereignty of other countries should condemn this Zionist entity persistent and repeated attacks against the Palestinian people on a daily basis. The United States should review its positions and abide by the principles of international law and human rights principles it proclaims on a daily basis. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our program. A special thanks to our guests who joined us. Special thanks to our political analysts and uh, activists who joined our show. Uh, very uh, much uh, thank you for you, uh, Mr. Steve uh, Sasabi, Dr. Farkin Bank, Tariq Abu Azoum, and uh, Muhammad. Thank you so much for all these analysis. Uh, with this, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end. Bye for now. <laughs>